Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Simon Phipps joins us. We're going to be talking about encryption and privacy with the Mozilla Encryption Campaign. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Simon Phipps. Episode 381, recorded March 30th, 2016. Mozilla Encryption Campaign. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Simple and fast cloud hosting built for developers. Deploy an SSD cloud server in 55 seconds. Try it today for free. Visit digitalocean.com, and once you sign up, be sure to enter the promo code FLOSS in the billing section to get your $10 credit. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be using every day and totally unaware of it, projects you may want to download right after the show and go play with it, and sometimes projects that are very, very informative, like today's is definitely going to be. Joining me today is Simon Phipps. Welcome back, Simon. Hi, Randall. It's good to be back again, especially on uh, such an important topic as encryption that we have today. Uh huh. This is definitely going to be an important topic. Uh, and where are you speaking to us from? Your usual lair? I'm once again from my secret underground lair in the south of England. And I am coming to you from a very new location. I've never done this here, but uh, ZipRecruiter is closing off their second floor where I was doing all the ones that was here. I'm now up on the 11th floor. With a, if you can see it, you can check the video it looks out. It's absolutely stunning out there. What, I, I don't know what you're. You, you've got the beach. You have sunshine. Yep. Beach, the ocean. There's some tall buildings. Luckily, the the sun is actually on the other side of the building uh, where I was before. So it's right. actually it's actually sort of working, even having the windows open like this. So that's very very cool. So I have a very interesting background for today. But it's not about backgrounds. It's not about where we are. It's about interesting projects. This week we have joining us uh, Brett Gaylor, who is a, a director at the Mozilla Foundation, and he wants to talk to us about a couple of specific. Uh, um, uh, encryption and uh, privacy awareness campaigns that they've just begun, or actually it's ongoing, I guess. That's, I guess we'll ask them stuff like that. Um, and uh, the Mozilla Foundation is working this so that we can be more aware of privacy that we need when we're chatting on facial, uh, like social networks and things. Um, uh, encryption, government's right to break encryption, what it means when the government wants to start advoc adv advocating putting in back doors and all sorts of wonderful things along that area. Uh, what do you know of this initiative already, uh, Simon? Uh, I nearly applied for an Open Web Fellows job this week that was being advertised. Uh, just decided not to as it was based in New York, but I'm fairly aware of it. And I do have to declare an interest in the topic because I'm on the board of directors of the UK's equivalent of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a thing called the Open Rights Group. So I'm following quite a lot of these topics um, from that posture as well. Oh, then you're the perfect co-host for this show. It's really cool. Well, it kind of works out that way every once in a while. Cool. So that's, uh, that's really nice. Well, um, we do want to bring on our guest fairly soon, but I have an important message before we bring him on. Because whether you're developing an app, a website, or working on a server-based project, you need flexible, reliable, and affordable hosting. DigitalOcean offers droplets, which are virtual private servers that can be customized and deployed easily to host websites, web apps, production applications, personal projects, virtual desktops, and almost anything else you can think of with full root access. This helps you get your project off the ground quickly and makes it easy to scale when you find success. DigitalOcean is used by over 600,000 developers, including me. I found out about DigitalOcean about a year and a quarter ago at scale, and I've been running a box continuously since, and it does all my FreeBSD builds so that I don't have to use my main machine to do that. You can uh, deploy and configure your droplets via streamlined control panel or a simple API. You can choose your OS, Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, Fedora, Aura, CoreOS, and FreeBSD. And this is the thing that attracted me. I love FreeBSD. Uh, select one of the many pre-configured one-clicks like Drupal, Docker, or Node.js to get up and running quickly, or build the exact infrastructure you need with root access to servers running 100% SSDs very fast in the state-of-the-art data centers around the world. It's highly scalable to meet the demands of a rapidly growing application or business. You can also use advanced features like floating IPs for high availability, private networking, and automated deployments via API. Extremely active community with a large and detailed set of tutorials on all the ways you can use your droplet. Want to configure a lab server? Set up a virtual desktop or VPN? They got you covered. 
And it's so easy to get started. You can deploy an SSD cloud server in as little as 55 seconds. DigitalOcean has incredibly affordable and straightforward pricing. Servers start at only $5 per month. There's also hourly pricing available starting at less than a penny per hour. Well, we're going to make it so you can get started today and deploy an SSD cloud server for free. Visit DigitalOcean.com and create an account. Once you confirm your email and account information, go to the billing section and enter a promo code FLOSS for a free $10 credit. That's plenty to get started and explore what DigitalOcean can do. That's DigitalOcean.com. And once you sign up, enter the code code F-L-O-S-S -S in the billing section to get your $10 credit for free. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support of Floss Weekly. And now let's go ahead and bring on our guest, Brett Gaylor. Welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Hey. Cool, cool. And where, where are you speaking to us from? Uh, I have found a quiet corner uh, of RightsCon, which is a conference happening here in San Francisco um, about uh, our, our human and civil rights online. Cool. So I, I gave my summary of what I was able to take away about Mozilla's encryption campaign. Uh, why don't you tell us, give us the 30,000 foot view and the scope so that we have a better sense of what we're talking about here. Yeah, so uh, this is a campaign that we began uh, uh, thinking about in December uh, of last year when we have lots of different folks at Mozilla who think about um, laws and um, conditions in the world that are going to af affect uh, citizens online. And one of the things that we thought was going to be a, a large issue in this year was encryption. And so f for us, we're always thinking about how um, average, everyday lay people think about these issues. And so we thought, hey, I think we think encryption is going to be one of those. And so we started uh, thinking about an educational campaign that would uh, help people understand how encryption is used in their everyday life. Um, and so we started to create a series of videos. And we happened to launch those in the same week as the Apple uh, FBI case broke. Um, so essentially what these are are uh, a series of videos and communications to our email list and uh, in the blogging community that just discuss how encryption is actually something that we all use every day and is a vital part of um, what makes the internet work and also allows us to um, just go through our everyday lives as, as normal citizens. When, whenever we use a credit card, we're using encryption. Whenever we um, have our medical records uh, sent securely by our doctors, we're using encryption. Whenever we um, chat online, we, we hope that the service providers are using some sort of encryption. Whenever we uh, enter our passwords or create passwords, we hope that those providers are using encryption. And so rather than look at um, uh, how, we, we really wanted to look at how encryption is used in, in your everyday life. And so the first video really looked at um, how, you know, a lot of people, when they think about encryption, they think that maybe this is something that is not is not for me. This might be for somebody that um, is working in intelligence or really has um, communications that um, that they need some level of secrecy. And that's not what encryption is. Encryption is, is something that we all use every day. And so we wanted to sort of meet our, our audience there with those first set of videos. Yeah, I think it's that most people, based on popular culture, most people believe that, you know, encryption is when you got spy versus spy stuff, you know, not realizing that every time they make a, you know, every time they make a bank transaction or, a, or a, um, you know, even read their email, presuming the email is set up properly, is, is that's all encrypted from end to end. Um, yeah, that's exactly that, that we wanted to, to, to really get people thinking about um, the fact that this is not, this is something that really does affect you, and and um, so that's why in that first video, the tack that we took was um, oftentimes when we talk about this, people say, well, I, I have nothing to hide, and that's kind of misses the point. We all have things in our life for which we wouldn't want, uh, we, want we want to be able to control how that information is shared. And so in the first video, we actually took kind of a humorous approach and we have a series of characters that, um, you know, they're communicating on their device and all of a sudden um, what, they're, what they're communicating to that trusted person is just displayed for everyone to see. And so you have sort of, you have a, an exterminator who's communicating with somebody and you realize that he's just bought some Justin Bieber tickets. You have a dad that's um, trying to like figure out 
why his son's hoop is blue, and, you, and then someone else sees that above his head. These are like examples of things that we, we, we would want to be kept private. You know, um, uh, a daughter um, getting nagged by her mom about uh, whether or not she has any grandkids yet. These are the kinds of the things that you don't have to be a spy versus spy to want to not necessarily want everybody to be able to see. And in fact, encryption safeguards privacy, which allows us to be um, our real and authentic self. You know, you couldn't be Randall without some expectation of privacy. And so just giving people a different frame to look at um, is what we were trying to do with the start of this campaign. And then as we went deeper, we actually said, okay, now that you know, you have m maybe looking at privacy in a different way. Let's look at what encryption really is. And so the second video in that campaign is more of a sort of explainer that might be familiar to those who have seen sort of the schoolhouse rock videos, um, you know, that used to be on Sesame Street that would explain, you know, how democracy works. We wanted to create something in that style but that explains what encryption is. And so that's an animated video. Uh, we then, you know, now that our audience understands that and they understand how privacy allows them to be them, we wanted to make a video that explored how encryption is actually safeguarding many of the core beliefs that we have in our democratic societies, like the freedom of the press. And so in that video, we interviewed somebody from the Freedom of the Press Foundation, which makes something called Secure Drop, which is uh, a, an open source project that allows um, whistleblowers or anybody who might want to communicate with a journalist anonymously to be able to, um, to do that with the expectation that, that that communication is secure. And so that uses encryption. And then the video that we're actually going to release today um, is a video that shows that there are worldwide legislative threats to encryption from the United Kingdom to France to, to other jurisdictions where we actually need citizens to, to be willing to, to stand up and let their decision makers in those countries know that encryption is important to them. And so that's the sort of arc that we have been taking um, people on over the last couple of months. Oh, so uh, a couple major issues are, I'm now reminded by, by, by what you just said. One of them is the problem of the millennials, where they're so used to posting every detail about themselves in all sorts of various public ways. They're, they're, I'm, I'm doing broad sweeps, obviously, but most of the people I talk to that are millennials are like, oh, yeah, I, I check it on Foursquare everywhere I go, and, and I, uh, I live stream stuff when I'm walking around. It's like they don't. They don't quite get the need for privacy like uh, the older ones would. Um, is that is that already come up as an issue for you? No, I tend to disagree with that. I think oh. that um, it's just that we have different cultural norms about about that privacy. And in fact, if you talk to a lot of young people, they actually are more attuned to that, and they just um, will. Um, in fact, because they're more used to, to sharing online and living their lives online, they have a bit more of a sophisticated understanding of, you know, what to share, when to share it, in which in which contexts. And mm, that's okay. why you see you th you see things like Snapchat being, like, you know, uh, really popular among that generation, um, because you know they they want a forum where some of those messages might be ephemeral. So they they really do understand that the things that they post on Facebook they might want to be careful of. So I, I tend to push back a little bit against that categorization that just because they like, you know, posting things on Instagram or, or sort of having a live streaming of their life that they don't care about privacy. In fact, when you, when they're surveyed and when, when you talk to them, they actually do have a lot of sort of nuanced understanding there. Um, it's kind of, it, the, the question for me is, are, are the platforms that they're sharing within and um, providing enough positive feedback loops where, you know, your privacy and those settings are, you know, part of the everyday process of, of using those systems. And so Facebook is like the famous example and they've come a long way, but it used to be that it was really hard to, to have that level of granularity about what you share and, and what you don't. Um, but that feels a little bit orthogonal to the encryption campaign that, that we're talking about. Um, but yeah, I think that it does speak to the fact that 
people are kind of thinking about privacy and privacy online in a new way um, because we're all online now. It isn't, it, it isn't like it was 10 years ago where maybe you had to be somebody that might listen to this podcast, to, for instance, to, have, to, to be online. Everybody is now. And so we're all kind of working through the ramifications of that. Okay, and then this, there's a whole other possibly orthogonal um, issue uh, continuing, and that's the police, the law enforcement officers, and the whole notion of uh, I have, I don't want my stuff to be seen by the general public, but I don't have anything that I would hide from law enforcement officers. And so they'll advocate for back doors and things like that. And then you have sort of at the other end of that, which is that, uh, you know, there shouldn't be any way for uh, an LEO to get access to all my stuff without going through a proper uh, court sequence and all that sort of stuff. And there's already ways to bypass that secret, uh, the FISA court, things like that. Uh, how do you see that, that, uh, that whole uh, discussion fitting in with this? You know, uh, I think what came out of the Apple case is this notion that, you know, the security of our users is, needs to be paramount. So as a, as a technology community, we need to be encouraging, you know, <laughs> we need to be actually encouraging tech companies to strengthen the security of the products, not undermine them. So that was the specific piece around Apple that, caused a lot of people to take a stand is that the, the, the tech community has repeatedly said, and in fact, there was, this was discussed in the 90s with uh, encryption already, it is impossible to create one um, backdoor, so to speak, that, that wouldn't be used uh, by others. And so the FBI's attempts to compel Apple to circumvent the security protections, that, would, that, that was problematic because we don't actually know the ripple effect that that would create. So that could, you know, if, if Apple were to do that for the FBI in this one case, then what would prevent um, law enforcement agents in other countries from making the same request? And so that was, that was the heart of that issue. Um, and we didn't want to see a sort of slippery slope created where that would become a precedent where that kind of change in that device that they might be compelled or any other tech company could be compelled to 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 follow through with those same requirements so that was the specific slippery slope that the tech community did not want to see happen and so th that's that's the debate around encryption that we simply can't afford to have is whether or not um, we can allow that for one device or for one manufacturer uh, the difficulty I see with all of that, Brett, is that um, encryption means more than one thing when we're talking with end users about it. it. It means encrypting our emails. It also means some component technology that's hidden inside our devices. Now, is, is your campaign looking at that whole spectrum? Is it, is it out there trying to get people to you know, encrypt their emails or to encrypt their, their mobile phones? Or are you looking more specifically at the uh, the, the issues like the... Uh, Apple case where, uh, honestly, it wasn't really about crypto. It was about a component technology that happens to be crypto that's deep inside the device. Yes, but it did happen to be <laughs> crypto, <laughs> so it was pretty relevant. I mean, yes, um, our campaign, like like I said, is really um, centered on lay people. So it's really is it was an educational campaign. It is an educational campaign, but uh, you, the 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 chapter that comes out this week, we call them sort of beats of our campaign, will start to say like, here are some things that you can do um, in your life um, to take some steps towards uh, encrypting. So, you know, one thing that you can do if you have an Apple device or a, a PC is to encrypt your hard drive. And so we'll give you some some steps for how, for how to do that. Um, th and there's other sort of uh, resources that we want to be able to give to um, to to citizens to be able to do this. But importantly, we also want to like let them know that um, we foresee that there are going to be moments where our our decision makers in, in governments are going to be voting uh, on bills of this nature. In the UK, that, that there is the investigatory powers bill that is going to be uh, likely voted on this year. And so we want 
w when those votes are ready, we want people to be notifying uh, their representatives that this is something that they don't support. But as a precursor to that, you actually do have to educate them uh, about um, how encryption is an important um, piece of their lives already. And so when they, when they say, you know, when David Cameron makes proposals about banning certain types of uh, strong encryption, they would say like, hey, that doesn't make any sense. I need this in my life and we need this in our economy. Right. But, uh, you know, ultimately, isn't this all just too hard? I mean, you know, there's still no crypto in Thunderbird. Um, there's, it, it's still um, so rare to get uh, email encrypted by anyone who isn't an FSF member that it looks like uh, malware when it appears in people's email. It, isn't there a deep problem that crypto is too geeky, too remote, too hard to use, too inaccessible to even make a case for people to adopt? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that, you know, the, but I, I mean, I do definitely agree that, you know, as a community, we have to make these tools easier to use. That, that, that's something that I think no one would disagree with. I also think that there's like pretty good movement uh, along those lines, you know, apps like Signal or in fact, end-to-end -end encryption being available on, uh, on Apple devices is a, is a pretty huge development in, in this space. And so signs are pointing, uh, you know, email itself used to be something that was only, only for nerds. And, and so like, I think that the things are trending in the right direction. Having said that, we do need to, um, you know, we do need to do all we can to encourage manufacturers to, to to build this in. I think we need to get to the place where you don't have to know or care what uh, words like public key encryption or end to end to know and trust that that this is being encrypted. And we, you know, that is the case with um, lots of parts of HTTPS that you know a user doesn't necessarily have to know what the out what the <laughs> what the actual cryptography going on behind the scenes is to know that this is that it's okay to do their banking on this website. And so we need to right. get to that point with a lot of other areas of communication. Uh, it, I mean, it strikes me that uh, encryption is rather like vaccination. It's one of those things where um, everybody should be doing it and it doesn't really become effective for society until there's a critical mass of people providing protection for everybody. Uh, it, it also strikes me that encryption is just as easy for idiots to debunk as vaccination is. Uh, it, you, you only have to have... <laughs> Uh, one one idiot giving uh, some weak arguments from a government security expert to debunk the whole thing. So I, I think that the point you're making there about getting it into into technologies as a default part is is really important. So I, I see that's kind of where your Open Web Fellows program is going. It, would you say that one of your goals is indeed to uh, deposit uh, Web Fellows in places where they're going to begin to enable these capabilities? Right, so Simon's talking about um, a program uh, that we have built in collaboration with the Ford Foundation called the Open Web Fellows Program. And this is actually a program that places technologists in civil society organizations. So it's, it's actually a little bit, um, it's, a it's a little bit different, Simon, because what we want to do here is for, you know, I can give an example of a, a fellow that was placed last year who was placed at Amnesty International and who worked side by side with uh, human rights workers in the field or with communications folks who help them understand what are the threat models for uh, a human rights worker that, that's in the field. So, for, you know, as a human rights worker, you, do not, you want to make sure that um, a citizen in that country who comes to you with potentially human rights violation or wants to make sure that they're safe is not actually putting themselves at danger by communicating with you. And so the Open Web Fellows Program is a means of getting those technologists and that sort of type of thinking into civil society. And it's actually um, kind of a, a field building exercise because, um, you know, a young talent that comes up uh, out of you know computer science or um, in the tech community we want them to see a career in, uh, you know, def defending rights just as much as they see a career uh, joining a venture backed, uh, venture capital backed startup. And so this is a program that's trying to provide some of those opportunities. Having said that, some folks will be placed in organizations that build cryptographic uh, technologies like at Freedom of the Press. Um, but this is actually a sort of a, um, a, a program that's that's developing capacity in the sorts of organizations that are here at RightsCon. 
Right, right. So, uh, I mean, it sounds a, a, a very good activity to be pushing forward. It, it does strike me that to get that critical mass level of use of encryption into society, we need to be um, driving the concept into people's expectations of what yeah. they're buying. You need, uh, you need both, it, right? You need, a, you need a mass movement that is going to, to help as many people as possible understand these issues and give them avenues to take action. But you also have to support the, 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 the civil society organizations that are going to be going at this for the, the long, long haul. And that's a different audience, right? That's, like a, that's, that's hundreds or thousands of, of dedicated human rights and civil society organizations. And then there's the general public. And how, how do you um, educate them? How do you get them um, in, invested in our issues and willing to take that step to become advocates themselves? And so um, Mozilla and lots of other allies in this space are sort of um, working on both fronts, the sort of like, how do you build um, a, a civil society sector and how do you engage the, the general public? Right, right. And what do you think about the conflict between uh, an, an advertising funded web and the need for encryption anchored privacy? I, I mean, I noticed that, uh, that webmail services typically don't offer to encrypt email for users. And I assume they do that because they want it to stay in the clear so that they can parasitize it with advertising. Uh, do you think there's a conflict between having a, a web that's funded by advertising and encryption-based privacy? Um, I'm not sure if I understand your, your, your question correctly, Simon. I know that, you know, for instance, Gmail does offer SSL encryption for, for some of those emails, um, but maybe you can give me some more examples. Well, so Gmail, the, when I use Gmail, the connection to Google servers is encrypted. But as soon as the email has left Google servers and is winging its way over, say, to uh, a, 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 a telco-based uh, ISP, it, the email is in the clear. Uh, there is no expectation of privacy with what's going on. And it strikes me that we need um, uh, Gmail to offer to encrypt the email so that when it leaves Google's network, it's also encrypted. And it strikes me that the reason that doesn't happen is because Google actually wants to have access to the content of the email ah, so, that, so that it can uh, advertise. And that's also the motivation for everybody else, Microsoft, Yahoo, whoever else. Yeah, that sounds like a, it would be a good subject for a, a pithy blog and, and good, good discussion about online. Obviously, I can't speak to, um, to, to Google's motivations there. But I think it is an interesting example of where, where there are some tensions and where we need to have like robust discussions about which one of these things is, is the most important. And, and um, you know, it's, again, an example of where, you know, public pressure, um, you know, public pr pressure can influence uh, large companies and l large uh, entities. But as a precursor to that, you have to help people understand the issues. And so that's an example of where this encryption campaign has, has been trying to go, has been trying to make them understand uh, what encryption is before they could even pose that, the question that you're asking. It's getting them to that, to, to helping get them to that level of understanding that you have. Right. Uh, so now I noticed that quite a lot of the programs that you're doing uh, are very US-based. Uh, do you have an international vision for this, or is it purely a US-based vision that you have? So are you talking about our Open Web Fellows program or the uh, encryption campaign? Uh, I, actually, both. Uh, I, the Open Web Fellows, uh, all the organizations that I've, you know, I haven't looked at it deeply, but all the organizations I've looked at where you have embedded uh, staff do appear to be U.S. organizations. And I haven't noticed you showing up at uh, any of the nonprofits I work at in the U.K. offering, pe offering people. Uh, and then so looking at the, the website, the it doesn't program. look like you have multiple languages on the videos either. Right. So with the Open Web Fellows Program, we have, um, uh, it, it, it's actually not the case that they're all US based. So we have one at Privacy International, which is based in London in the UK, at European Digital Rights, which is in Brussels, um, at a law clinic called Sipit, which is in Kenya, uh, which is in Nairobi in Kenya, uh, at the Citizen Lab, which is in Canada, and only, uh, in fact, two of the eight are based in, in the United States. With regards mm -hmm. to the language of the encryption campaign, um, what we wanted to do, so we, we run a lot of sort of um, testing when we're doing those campaigns. Um, so for instance, like 
you know, we might try one messaging versus another to see which what users respond to. And so our plan is to actually, after we've been able to crunch those numbers to see what people are responding to, is the, to then localize those videos. And so that work has started this week. And so we'll probably go out first in some of the languages that we know people respond to and have on our mailing list. So that's Spanish, uh, Brazilian, Portuguese, uh, German, and French. Um, and then to roll them out that way. But because our largest audience is English, that's where we can see the results that have enough statistical significance where we can say like, okay, that approach seems to be working with that. Let's put our investments there. Because we are a nonprofit, so we have to be somewhat um, judicious in how, we, in how we allocate those funds. And so we have to just make sure that we're getting the most bang for our buck before we go into that translation. And uh, I know you, you uh, want to get back to the conference, so I'm, I've only got like a few more questions to ask. Um, and then the all-inclusive question, is there anything we didn't cover that we should? Uh, but I'll wait for that for the end. Uh, one of the things I'm curious about is, do you have a goal here? Or is this going to be like a forever thing? <laughs> it's going to be a forever thing for sure. I mean, <laughs> um, you know, it's like one of these um, contradictions in doing this kind of work is like, I would love it if, you know, we could just like, Put a box on it. The, the internet is free. Everybody understands. <laughs> Everybody understands. There are no corporations or governments who are trying to lock down the internet. We're done. But I don't. Unfortunately, Randall, I, I'm not sure that that's going to be the case. So you know, we, Mozilla and lots of allies in the space are invested for the long haul. Um, but as on this campaign, um, we are we're sort of completing one beat right now, which asks for some users to to essentially stand up and say like, yes, I want to advocate for encryption in my community and I want to take some steps to, to doing that. And so that'll be sort of one point where um, we'll call this campaign done and um, give each other some high fives. But then we do, you know, as, as Simon mentioned, we, we, we now want to take this to maybe a different, um, and then try it in a different language, try it in a different teaching context, build different curriculum around it, that kind of thing. So it's definitely a long, a long haul effort. And uh, what kinds of people are you looking for to help with this? Uh, rights people, uh, like, like somebody who might also subscribe to the EFF uh, line of thinking, uh, or um, do you want actual technologists so you can have more technical discussions about encryption? Uh, what are you looking for to gain more uh, support for you? Yeah, definitely. Um, we work with lots, you know, you mentioned EFF, so that's like one example. There's some people outside of this room that we're, that we're definitely talking to. And so we have lots of programs like the Open Web Fellows that Simon mentioned that are for, you know, people who are digital rights activists. But generally, we want, we want everyday citizens and users of the web to um, see the importance of this in their life and to be able to stand up to take action. So it's like, I don't want to be fast, I'll say like we're looking for everybody, but we are looking for people who um, who this resonates with and who want to um, you know, become active and become advocates and to share this message to, to in the same way that, you know, years ago when, when Firefox first launched, that that success was based on people, you know, going to their cousin and saying like, "Hey, have you tried this? It works. Let me help you install it on your computer." We're at a similar point now with some of these these debates. So we want people to say like, "Hey, you should use Signal, the the mobile um, the mobile chat system that allows you to send messages securely." Or did you know um, that you can encrypt your hard drive? Or did you know that you should be looking for these sorts of indicators in your browser when you're when you're communicating securely. And so we really do want that kind of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, grassroots level of support. Awesome, awesome. Hey, uh, again, and my final question will be, is there anything we didn't talk about today that you want to make sure is covered before we let you go? Uh, that's an awesome question. Um, I think that uh, uh, the URL, if anybody wanted to look at the videos that we've made, is advocacy.mozilla.org slash encrypt and all the videos that we mentioned today are on there um, as are some ways that uh, people can get involved yeah we're actually going to run those three videos right after we get rid of you so we, they oh, will awesome. be seeing this in the video yeah yeah we decided cool. to do that while you were talking anyway uh it's been wonderful talking to you brett it's a very important thing that you're uh that you're helping move forward and uh, I'm, I'm glad you could spare a few minutes out of the conference to uh to talk to us today thanks randall thanks simon
All right. Bye, Brett. That was uh, Brett Gaylor, who is the, uh, uh, he's a director at the Mozilla Foundation, and he's working on the Mozilla encryption campaign, as you just heard. What do you think uh, there, Simon? I, well, I think it's a, a great thing to be doing. You know, that right now we really need to ha see encryption and, uh, more importantly, technology-backed privacy uh, becoming more and more commonly used out in society. And I think people need to get away from seeing encryption as a geeky thing and seeing it more and more as the default that guarantees they have a chance of privacy. And then uh, Brett's completely right. We're going to see challenge after challenge to uh, cryptography coming out of governments around the world uh, because the ag government agencies like here in the UK, GCHQ, there in the USA, NSA, uh, are extremely keen to blame their, um, the, their intelligence failures on uh, encryption rather than on uh, the need to have coordinated, joined up intelligence run by well-funded intelligence agents. And so we're going to see more and more challenges to cryptography. We're going to see uh, badly informed politicians attacking it. And it's really important that we have organizations like Mozilla spending money on protecting the, the basic technology of privacy, which is what cryptography is. Yeah, and I recall uh, there's some sort of simple interface to talk about encryption over on the EFF website, but I can't remember the full URL of it. I, I probably have said it before on this show. Um, uh, one of the things that we didn't even touch, but I think is interesting, is, is along the privacy issues is, you know, how, how much data can the law enforcement people gather on us without having some sort of a, a judicial oversight? Uh, it's obviously the line is moving way over towards executive branch strength and uh, way away from even having any kind of oversight. There's a, you know, I, I, I first uh, ran into this when I saw that uh, roving wiretaps uh, came in with the USA Patriot Act. And I said, this takes out, you know, before this act came in, if, a, if an LEO wanted to tap a particular phone, he had to go to a judge and get and explain his case. And then the judge would say yes or no. But that wouldn't apply to the next phone over. If the guy switches phones, now we have the ability to just say, without any judicial oversight, I think he's going to use the pay phone down at the corner. I'm going to tap that now. And that's mm -hmm. not sufficient for me. That's not enough checks and balances anymore. Uh, well, we, Go ahead. Well, the, you know, the, the, the problem is even deeper than that. Uh, it, the, the government agencies have got a doctrine that asserts that because the Internet is public, it's okay for them to cache it. And so mm -hmm. what GCHQ, the NSA, and equivalent agent agencies in every other country are doing is they are persisting the data flows over the Internet. Uh, and if those data flows are not encrypted, then phishing expeditions, with or without a warrant, will be likely to pick up a real fish and also a mistaken fish that result yep. in people being wrongly accused and wrongly arrested. So this, this doctrine that says that everything on the Internet is fair game to persist indefinitely is the reason why we really need encryption. It's because everything that isn't encrypted is going to be open for casual inspection by the sort of agents that you're talking about. And that's why I think that we really need to get to a world where the assumption is encryption and the exception is in the clear, rather than the world we're in at the moment where the assumption is in the clear and the exception is encryption. And uh, because we're talking in uh, timely about the uh, Apple FBI case, uh, what scares me more than their consistent headbutting on this issue is that uh, when they vacated the order, when they said, Apple, uh, never mind, we don't need you. That tells me that there is some other mechanism by which they're going to get the data. And uh, I'm more scared of that than I am of, you know, the fight between Apple and FBI. Well, you know, I think you should assume that uh, that the law enforcement agencies can break any encryption that you use. So if you do actually commit a crime, I think you should expect that encryption will give you no shelter. The reason we're focusing on encryption is not for those cases where somebody is genuinely a criminal. Uh, the, the reason we're focusing on encryption is that without encryption, uh, everybody is a sus suspect in every crime all the time because law enforcement is persisting the Internet and using it for phishing expeditions. Uh, but uh, when it comes to uh, devices like iPhones or Android phones that you've appro added appropriate encryption to, uh, 
uh, I don't think those are going to give you any protection against a determined law enforcement agency. In this case, um, you know, all of my friends think that uh, the FBI used mechanical and uh, electronic means to crack the iPhone, that they didn't bother with the software at all. They, they, uh, they just use electronics to do it. And there's going to be some way to break that device open if you have genuinely given someone calls to do so. What I care about is making sure that people can't casually go and look in everybody's communications all the time for things that might disclose whether they are, you know, let's say that uh, when, when you lovely people in America end up with President Trump and it begins to be uh, unacceptable to, uh, to be transgender to the point of being a crime, uh, do you really want people able to look back at your last 15 years of emails and find indications of who it is that needs interring in an LGBT equivalent of Manzanar. I don't think you want that. And that's the reason you need encryption today and tomorrow, not so much for the, 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 the big cases like the FBI Apple case. Now, that was a very significant case because the FBI was asking Apple to do something completely unacceptable. They were trying to enslave them into doing work for the government to uh, defeat a, a protection measure. And I think that was a wrong thing to ask Apple to do. But we have to keep these two cases clear. Uh, mm -hmm. Encryption for everyone is there to protect all of us against uh, 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 unreasonable search and to protect our expectation of privacy. Um, strong encryption is never going to hold out if you actually are a criminal. Somebody is going to break through it in the end. And, uh, and another thing that uh, just uh, timely revealed uh, this week, there's a, a bunch of uh, research that was been done to actually name who the creator of TrueCrypt was. And um, <laughs> you have to Google for it. Well, it was in like Reddit or something as well. Um, no, Hacker News. And not only that, it uh, turns out that uh, uh, he was also involved in uh, criminal activities. So an uh, interesting overlap there. We had the guy that uh, took and forked TrueCrypt called Veracrypt, and he uh, apparently has some of the history about that. Um, uh, but, uh, but the other thing is that uh, in that article, um, it was, um, it was um, I, I'm, I'm being told that yesterday's uh, uh, SN, what's that? Uh -oh. Security now. <laughs> What's that saying? Oh, oh, security now. Sorry, my 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 my. my. Sorry, Steve. Sorry, Steve. What the hell? What else are you doing? Okay, right. Um, the other thing that it's in that article that was revealed is that Edward Snowden actually had said when he was at the NSA a couple of years ago as a contractor that they could not yet break TrueCrypt. So uh, while you, you mentioned that, you know, every encryption is breakable, um, Snowden is at least, he might be lying to us. This might be a cover story. I don't know. But, but I would still strongly advocate using Veracrypt now because TrueCrypt is at the end of life. Uh, Veracrypt is being actively maintained by the guy we had on the show, I think, about a year ago. Um, and it made a lot of security improvements and stuff. So I would suggest going back to that Floss Weekly and watching that if you want to know what's that different about Veracrypt. Um, I think that's probably enough banter for us to go back and forth a little bit. Uh, so uh, uh, we, we talked about these three videos. We're actually going to play those videos for you right now. Imagine a world where you couldn't choose who got to see your private life, like your family squabbles. Your medical information. or your guilty pleasures. Imagine if you couldn't choose who knew your job struggles. Or your financial details. You don't want to live in a world without privacy. So let's not. Choosing what's public and what's private allows you to be you. Spread the word about privacy tools like encryption. Hello, friend. I'd like to introduce you to someone who doesn't get enough credit, even though she's a key part of what makes the web work. Encryption's job is to take the important information in your life and make sure it stays private. When encryption is strong, only people you want to see your information are able to. There's a very good chance that you use encryption today without even knowing it. When you swipe your credit card, you're using encryption. The numbers of your credit card are scrambled as they travel between you and your bank. 
When you log on for online banking, email, or to share cat videos, your usernames and passwords are generally encrypted. If they aren't, they should be. How do you know if a site is using encryption? If there's a little lock next to the URL, then you know the encryption is being used. Some messaging apps like Apple's iMessage encrypt messages when you send them to make sure that only the person you intended can see your message. Encryption isn't just about your favorite website. She safeguards your medical records when sent by your doctor and can help reporters to protect their sources so that important stories can be told. The web we love is safer because of encryption. Join Mozilla so we can work together to keep encryption strong. When lawmakers try to villainize encryption, it really does a disservice to the public debate. I think a lot of people think about encryption in terms of privacy, but it's often the most useful when we're talking about free speech, the ability to speak freely to somebody without another party interfering. The First Amendment or other rights like it guaranteed in other countries are really a safety valve for democracy. When everything else breaks down, this is how uh, the public can still hold their governments accountable. Increasingly, uh, encryption is playing a huge role in upholding those free expression rights. One of the major projects we work on is trying to teach and help journalists learn how to use encryption tools to better protect their sources. There are many people inside the U.S. Congress and other governments around the world who have no understanding about how important encryption is, not just to our privacy, but to our security and our economy. By banning encryption or forcing tech companies to insert back doors, we are putting all of ourselves at risk. We need to make sure that our governments understand that this is the case. Our upcoming guest looks uh, pretty full for a while, which is really nice. Uh, next week, we have the OSCON preview. Uh, the OSCON, uh, some of the senior people from the OSCON are coming in to talk to us about what we expect to see that's new and unusual this year at OSCON. I will be at OSCON, by the way, uh, covering that for Floss Weekly. Uh, and they've also told me that you can use the code FLOSS uh, for a 20% discount. Uh, uh, sorry, I got pop-up windows over here for a second. Okay, uh, for a 20% discount and, uh, and for their fairly expensive conference fees. I've never paid it because I've always been a speaker or a, or a press, uh, but I hear it's really expensive. And then coming up the two following weeks, we're going to have William Braswell, who is going to talk to us about the future of Pearl and how to make Pearl go faster. Everybody wants it faster. So he'll be on uh, one week to talk just about the overall performance increasing subjects, Okay. Uh, and that's uh, drawn from his website, pearl11.org. We're taking Pearl all the way to 11. Yes, it actually is the, uh, the, uh, the Spinal Tap reference. And then the following week, he'll be talking about our Pearl, which is uh, basically looking at your Pearl code and, and um, uh, figuring out where it can actually convert it directly to C. It has to meet a bunch of criteria. And then inlines that C using the inline C function. So your program magically becomes optimized for the parts that can be done in C. And that's really amazing. That's actually a fairly mature project. So I think it's around like three or four years. Uh, following that, BUI, private uh, community-based crisis response system. So it's a great way of having like a friends network where if something you're, you're you know, walking down a dark street and you see people coming up behind you, you can push a button and your GPS coordinates will be sent to your friends instantly. But the thing about this is all privately hosted, so it's not involving government agencies, things like that. So pretty darn cool. Um, and then following that, we have two new people just out of the schedule. Uh, Simply, which is a simple API for making PDFs out of templates. Uh, we're not going to be talking so much about the code, but he's got some interesting ideas about uh, how to bring more people in using open source. Um, so that's that was simply just the reason to uh, uh, get in there. And then also new to the schedule, we've got uh, the best practices badge, which is uh, for open source software to go through and answer a bunch of questions about their software and to see, uh, are you following best practices in this area? And if you say yes to enough things, all of it, I guess, all the things, say yes to all the things, uh, you get to have the right to put a badge on your main website and wherever else you need it, I guess, and to say, hey, I'm doing the right thing with me. So, uh, so that's, a, that's really cool. So I'm looking forward to that show as well. We're still looking for more for Q2. I'm still sending out mails and mails and mails, trying to have that happen. You can watch my progress at twit.tv slash floss and get the uh, taping times there, the taping days there of all the shows I just mentioned. Uh, I could always use more guests. 
If you've got a project that is not on that big list, uh, email the community coordinator or the project leader, however you can get a hold of them, and tell them to email me, Merlin at Stonehenge.com. That address is on the homepage, twitch.tv slash floss. Um, and uh, we'll put them on. That's how it works. This this uh, this this podcast is all about you guys. And, uh, I'd say 80% of the uh, episodes we've had in the last uh, is it nine years, nine years, <laughs> man, I've been doing this too long, uh, have all been uh, crowdsourced, so I appreciate all that. Uh, we normally have a live stream at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays. That's the day we normally tape. Uh, we've got a bit of unusual stuff coming up this week and next, but uh, just uh, watch for my uh, tweets and, and uh, Google Plus uh, things so you know when we're actually taping. You can uh, follow us on Floss Weekly on Google Plus or that, get t that gets tweeted forward to Floss Weekly on Twitter. And you can follow me at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on Twitter. And I'm more likely to be seen as Randall L. Schwartz on Google+. Plus. about 22,000 followers on Google+. Plus. I'm still maintaining it. It's really fun. Uh, you can do, uh, let's see, I'm going to be at OSCON, as I just said. Uh, I'll be at Yapsi North America, again, as a uh, 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 looking for new shows. Uh, so I'll be there representing Floss Weekly. I'm also going to be at Fizzle which is a big conference in Porto Alegre, Brazil, every year. I am going to be one of their featured international speakers, and uh, that is already confirmed. I just need to figure out what I want to talk about. And I'm also going to be at DragonCon in September. I'm talking on the EFF track there, and I think I know what one of my topics is going to be. I think it's going to be this whole encryption, Apple phone, um, Apple iPhone, uh, you know, and a lot of stuff we got talked about today. Maybe I'll get more involved with this, uh, this uh, movement. And I have a lot to talk about in the course, so that'll be fun. Uh, Dragon Con's in Atlanta in September on very hot Atlanta Labor Day weekend. Uh, what do you got to the plug, Simon? Uh, I just wanted to say, on your long list of potential shows, uh, if your uh, project has been on that long list for a long time and nothing seems to have happened, it's well worth you uh, asking your community lead, your project manager, to get back in touch with Randall and say, hey, we're still interested in doing that show, even though we've been ignoring your email for three years. Uh, because yeah. then, we'll, then we'll have you on the show. Just because your project is on the list doesn't mean it's guaranteed to appear because we may have lost touch with the uh, contact at the project. I hope you don't mind me saying that, Randall. Yes. Um, so I don't have a great deal coming up. Uh, if you want to follow the stuff that I'm saying and writing, you'll find it's mostly at uh, webmink.com, W-E-B-M-I-N-K.com. You'll find me on Twitter as webmink. Uh, you'll find me on Google Plus as uh, Simon Phipps, where I have how many followers? I've got 17,373 followers, Randall. Are you catching uh, up? <laughs> uh, I, I have no idea whether I'm going to be at OSCON at the moment. Uh, I have a ticket. Uh, I have somewhere to stay. I don't have uh, any way to get there at the moment because there's this ocean in the middle. Um, apart from that, you'll hear me showing up on Floss Weekly. I think I'm hosting one of the shows next week. Um, so that's really all I've got to plug. Oh, I do keep on reading um, uh, Linux Voice magazine. Linux Voice magazine, I'm writing a column every month, and we would love to have you uh, taking out a subscription. Uh, we've got to the end of uh, the subscription year, and we would like to have a lot of people renewing or getting new subscriptions uh, so that uh, we can keep on paying people to eat and live and have houses to live in. Uh, so that's everything, Randall. Cool. And I'll just say to further that about uh, looking at the list as it currently is, everybody that's on that list that said agreed to a show, negotiating dates, is someone I have contacted at least every six months without a peep back from most of them. So that's how rough this show is. I send out 16 emails, I might get one person because even if they're in that, that upper branch. So I don't know how to do this any better. I mean, I send email and, and they don't respond. So if, you, yep. if anybody, if any of your projects are there. Nag people for us. Please nag people and get them to yeah. respond to their email because we want to interview them. They've just got, mm -hmm. to, uh, they've just got to show up and then we'll do it. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the thing, and and the the names actually move around. I, as I as I do an invitation, I move it up towards the top of the list. So I'm, I'm trying to also like churn it too, so that it's it, it uh, gets like that. But that's just a little behind the scenes information. So uh, uh, Simon, I want to thank you for the lively discussion at the end of the show there about uh, encryption and privacy and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you apparently know a lot about this, as he said in the beginning of the show. Yeah, this is so. This is actually one of my uh, interests. Uh, as I say, I'm on the, I've been on the board of directors of the Open Rights Group for a number of years. Uh, we're the organization that is um, uh, taking the lead against uh, the incursion into our privacy in the UK when it comes to digital rights. Uh, we do also work with a number of other organizations. We're part of uh, the European Digital Rights Initiative, EDRI, that uh, uh, Brett mentioned. Um, and we have got a, uh, a, a real need for 
uh, British people to have a monthly subscription to help us pay for our staff and to do our campaigning work. So if, if you live in the UK and you are not already a supporter of the Open Rights Group, please visit openrightsgroup.org and uh, give us a £5 a month subscription to help us to hire staff and campaign for your digital rights and in particular uh, to make sure that the, uh, uh, the investigatory powers bill, the IP bill, doesn't take away your freedom and your privacy. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, it's about that time, so we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly.